work. Homegirl get that paper all on her own. Stop that. You're white. I'm homegirl. So I am confusion. Why is this one Kansas? But this one is not Arkansas. Why she keep trying to talk black? But why? Do you want me to talk like this all the time? Or oh my god, you want me to talk like this all the time? Where the f did your accent go? Executive orders that have already been put in place in New Hampshire. New Hampshire. I speak jive. Oh. Just hang loose, blood. She gonna catch up on the rebound out of Medsa. You're not a chicken. You gonna roll up to that way and you gonna be like, bok bok. I think a bonics. It is absurd. I told you someone is leaking information, right? America is co-opting our slang faster than ever. Yes, I, 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 I've used it. It'll be our pleasure. Well, I know it, but I don't think I should say it. Shoot, Roscoe cracked that dough? I kicked it off the heezy and bears. What did you just say? The type never made it east of the Rockies. It was a colloquialism that originated in Hunters Point, San Francisco, and died on your MTV raps. I can't believe that you just said that. The N word? So? Nobody's around. Yeah. Nobody is saying we want to change English, we want to teach black English. I rip it hardcore like porno flick. I roll with groups of ghetto bastards with biscuits. Oh, look, they got a translation for white people. I give 110% when it comes to helping my community, even though I occasionally associate with some less than reputable characters. Oh, as if. When I was a freshman in college, a series of unfortunate events with a white roommate led to a behavior evaluation from the school conduct board. While I discuss this more at length in my book, Angry Black Girl, Shameless Plug, the short version is that my vindictive, wannabe tough roommate claimed to be afraid of me and attempted to take out a restraining order, requesting to kick me out of my dorm. I went on a Twitter rant, recounting what happened to my followers, summing things up with LMAO, dead, and to my audience of mostly black tweeters and internet using millennials in 2000. 12, that meant I was laughing at the situation in disbelief. But to the white generation X man who printed out my tweet, held it up at my behavior probationary meeting, and kicked me out of my dorm and set me up for two drug tests a semester until my sophomore year, it was allegedly a threat to the white girl who told me she was gonna kick my ass. <laughs> I'm dead. There are much earlier examples in my life of slang being misunderstood, and they schooled me early that code switching is necessary. But the freshman year situation was the most serious and illuminating to me and the basis of this rant. It is 100% clear that the behavior officer who did all of that to me was racist, but his justification hinged on him willfully misunderstanding and expecting other colleagues to misunderstand my words. Words that weren't even for him or for the alleged victim. I painstakingly explained to the committee what the slang term meant to much skepticism. I nearly got kicked out of college and set up for a lawsuit and again two drug tests a semester that I had to pay for on my broke college student budget. But everything worked out in the end. What if it hadn't? This is what I thought about during recent high profile controversies. What can be said about the way we talk? Would my tweet have been misunderstood in 2023 in an era when black slang has impacted internet speak and infiltrated offline language more than ever before? And speaking Speaking of, can you really steal words? Lastly, if American standard English and white beliefs about what is offensive have been prioritized from the beginning, what does that say about the way language is policed now? It's about to get spicy in here. Yeah, I'ma bring up that Rihanna fine as fuck controversy and Flo Millie, Lizzo, and Beyonce too. Before we get into this video, let's do an experiment. American descendants of enslaved people, do you prefer being called African American, Black American, or something else? Where are you from and how how old are you? And do you use the N-word? Do you care about black people not from America using the N-word? Leave a comment, cause I'm trying to see something. As it turns out, language is as messy and chaotic as humans are, and informed by our personal experiences and backgrounds. To tell the full story, let's pull some examples from world history. The 
definition of etymology is the history of a word or phrase shown by tracing its development and relationships. Some words and phrases stick with us longer than others. For instance, both idiot and moron, insults for stupidity and ignorance, have been in use since ancient Greece. In recent times, both words have been likened to the R word as being ableist and accused of being rooted in the oppression and mistreatment of those with learning disabilities. But notice that I only censored the R word, which has not been socially acceptable since my late teens. While both words moron and idiot would be used in the 20th century during a greater process of sterilizing the so-called mentally feeble and awful eugenics programs, these were not the original intended uses. Idiotes, root word idiot or self, was used in ancient Greece to describe self-involved people who didn't participate in the democratic system or concern themselves with politics. Somewhere along the line, it became the go-to insult for poor decision making and voicing uninformed thoughts. Clearly, words change. Etymology is a fun and illuminating subject because the way words change reflect a period's social standards, changes, and movements. My favorite example of old words becoming new words lies in the 1900s version of thought, hussy. The term housewife officially entered written record around the year 1200 and it was spelled hooswif. By the 1500s, wives who took care of the household were sometimes called hoosive and hussy. By the next century, somebody's negative experience with the housewife led to the term getting an extra meaning, a frivolous or impertinent woman. Additional grammatical changes, including a distinction via pronunciation, would lead to the formalization of housewife and hussy into their current meanings by the 19th century. But for a good chunk of history, hussy and housewife meant the same thing. I find 19th century Europe to be especially important in this narrative because women were expected to desire marriage and children in the Edwardian era. And the Victorian era later hardened the separate spheres between men and women. The devoted, married, sexless housewife and the masculine, virile, sporting husband archetypes were pushed in this period of industrial revolution while sex workers grew in number on the London streets. Clearly, someone thought there needed to be a distinct difference between the housewife and the hussy. More recently in our period of racial division and inflamed culture wars here in America, woke, an evolution of the directive to stay woke, has warbled between slang term and now dog whistle. Despite Erica Badu recently saying she started the slang term and others crediting Harlem author William Melvin Kelly with the term in a 1962 New York Times essay called If You're Woke, You Dig It, the Twitter archivist account Black Power BA found that the blues singer Lead Belly used the term stay woke as early as 1938. Back when I associated Black American conspiracy theory leaning contrarianism with woke in 2021, I was noting a phenomenon of woke being thrust onto celebrity anti-intellectuals who use shallow language to signal solidarity with no praxis to back it up. I regret using woke in the colloquial form that I was accustomed to and not tracing its history. Now, in a flourishing black intellectual renaissance on social media that desires reparations, critical race theory in schools, representation and equity in a post-Obama world, numerous Republicans and racists have co-opted the term woke to simply mean black or anti-white when criticizing progressive or inclusive legislation, slinging it in the same manner as their ancestors used the hard ER without consequence. Additionally, Florida governor and presidential wannabe Ron DeSantis and others have attached woke, which I grew up hearing being attached to conspiracy theories about a gay agenda, to LGBTQIA activism. Woke had no such meaning before the Trump years. In my neck of the woods growing up, woke meant you watched hidden color documentaries, believed Dr. Sebi cured HIV, and you believed in the Illuminati. Woke did not mean being leftist or being pro-LGBTQ. It was quite the opposite. Speaking of, another example of words changing is phobia. Up until the 80s, it had been considered an anxiety disorder, an extreme, irrational fear of something that may cause a person to panic. But 90s gender and sociology studies discourse has transformed the suffix in the average American lexicon. Words like homophobia, biphobia, whorephobia, fatphobia, transphobia, etc. are used to indicate that a person is not just irrationally afraid of a certain group or thing, but also hateful. So clearly, words and language change and are impacted by history and the social environment. With all of this in mind, how did colonization and slavery impact the ways in which we speak? Whether I 
call it African American vernacular English, African American language, black English, or Ebonics, someone will be upset. And that's just the beginning of the many internal disputes surrounding the ways black Americans speak. The other dispute is whether or not AAVE is its own language, a dialect, or simply a lexicon of slang. Language is a broad method of human communication, like English or French. Dialect is a particular form of a language that is specific to a region or social group, impacting speech patterns and even how we pronounce words like aunt, ant, Caribbean, Caribbean, caramel, caramel, schedule, schedule, adult, adult, pajama, pajama, mayonnaise, mayonnaise, or even, hmm, hypergamy. And I wanna hear you black Americans say plantain, okay? All right, I bet you say plantain. Meanwhile, slang is the words and phrases used among particular cultural groups and dialects that historically were not formally accepted. Slang has typically had a life cycle going from fringe use to popular status then to being passe. This life cycle is growing shorter and shorter thanks to the internet, while simultaneously, slang has been incorporated into American dictionaries, blurring the lines between what is American English and what is slang. This is especially pertinent when it comes to Ebonics. Think of the term bay, which was widely a black term of endearment prior to 2014, and then white tweeters got a hold of it from their trips to black Twitter, and bay won an entry in Merriam-Webster this year. It's well documented and discussed that Ebonics originated in part from West African languages that fused with American English, largely in the plantation South. The earliest enslaved came from all kinds of African groups with different languages, meaning this speech was never truly uniform. Sojourner Truth, a native Dutch speaker, delivered a speech in 1851 that a white abolitionist, Francis Gage, rewrote. Not only did Gage falsely say that Sojourner claimed to be able to take a lashing as well as a man, but she added a southern enslaved dialect that would become central to negative stereotypes about black Americans. Black speech patterns further gained variations during the Great Migration, as black people moved to concentrated areas of the country that provided more differences. While some of the most prominent black leaders and thinkers, Mary Church Terrell, W.E.B. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, etc., were celebrated because of their middle class achievements, respectable natures, ideas, and their command of the standard English language. Poems, music, and slave narratives, WPA narratives, and writings like Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God and Barracoon reflected how the majority of the population spoke. But this speech was targeted. Long before actresses like Aquafina and TikTok videos about speaking like a black person, Person, our speech patterns and slang words were mocked and appropriated in minstrel shows by blackface wearing white actors, and later during racist radio shows like Amos and Andy. By the way, there are still tons of fans of minstrel content. Amazon sells minstrel records that people say brings back happy memories. The fuck kind of childhoods did you have? The use of Ebonics was seen as a sign of inferior intelligence, and various biographies and memoirs detail the ways in which black people who want to get ahead must a shoe sounding ghetto or hood. Having an accent that wasn't fully assimilated into standard English was looked down upon. As someone who occasionally mispronounces words and gets comments that seek to serve as an intellectual slam dunk, I was fascinated to find that a 1973 study of first grade black children in the classroom observed that black children would often answer questions correctly, but then would be chided for pronunciation or grammar, leading them to become moody and withdrawn. The study also showed that interrupted students had lower test scores. Some would argue that additionally, what was being lost in the instruction were teachers' inability to speak the way their students were. Was Ebonics interfering with standard American English instruction? Ebonics itself was coined in 1973 by Dr. Robert Williams, an African-American social psychologist who helped establish black studies. It's a blend of ebony and phonics. He and other black social scientists had gathered at a conference to discuss the psychological development of black children and disliked the term black English. In 1975, Williams published Ebonics, the true language of black folks, to reflect the multinational linguistic results of the African slave trade. Who knew that 21 years later, Ebonics would cause a massive controversy? But more on that in a second. Through the 
the remainder of the 70s and into the 80s, Ebonics the term lived purely in academia, but Ebonics itself was shared in mass media like black exploitation films and music. Show enough, Jive Turkey! Am I canceled? Also in the 1970s, there was a shift towards targeted black consumer advertising. McDonald's was notorious for dropping the G on words in its urban ads and rolled out the Get Down campaign. Claim one ad covered by Lanika Cruz for the Atlantic on the real. Kids can really dig getting down with McDonald's. Black speech was also mocked, like when in the early 80s, habitual piece of shit, felon, and racist Dinesh D'Souza, then just the editor of the Dartmouth Review, published an anti-affirmative action article entitled This Show Ain't No Jive, Bro, which was written in Ebonics. Editorials like these would lead to protests by students. As those of us born in the late 1900s will attest, there were way more speech patterns, dialects, and accents before the internet. Videos of people from the past show a wide variety of speech patterns, cadences, and ways of pronouncing things. The fanatics out here waiting on Return to Jedi. Three years in the making, we're waiting for this. Some people don't idolize Darth Vader like I do. See, I want him to get Luke. And uh, I think that, uh, that that Luke will destroy Darth Vader. I guess Darth Vader will die. I'm not sure. I hope he does, and I love his black. The Valley Speak dialect and accompanying slang was first highlighted among young white girls in the San Fernando Valley in the 80s and became popular nationwide thanks to MTV and depictions in mass media like Frank Zappa's song Valley Girl. However, the upward lil at the end, where everything is a question, has been alleged to have been around in other places like Australia, England, and New Zealand as early as the 50s. The 80s California vowel speak popularized terms like gag me with a spoon and what's your damage? The connotation of valley girl speak was negative. It was associated with vanity and stupidity. There was even a book by a speech pathologist that attempted to teach vowel girls how to talk again. Generation X's slang and dialect would further be impacted by everything from gangster rap music to Buffy the Vampire. Slayer. America's cultural currency, or soft power via the largest movie industry in the world, and music meant that slang and standards of American English were being exported worldwide. For instance, hip hop and boys in the hood popularized the black term for whore, aka ho, with it entering mainstream use by 1993. The lazy. Hoes gotta eat too. <laughs> Wait a minute, nigga, who you calling a hoe? I ain't no hoe. Oops. I'm sorry, bitch. <laughs> hey, hey. Watch your mouth. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary was also growing more inclusive with its entries. In 1993, it was reported that Ain't was published without any warning against its use. That news didn't reach my teachers because Ain't was still considered bad English and a sign of intellectual inferiority in Charlotte, North Carolina in the 2000s. It was the kind of word I'd use with friends, but never in class or around white classmates to avoid being stereotyped. That's a form of code switching. On December 18th, 1996, the Oakland School Board, over overseeing a student population that was over 50% black, passed a resolution declaring Ebonics to be the language of its 28,000 black students. Citing the fact that black students had lower literacy rates than white ones and that 71% of those enrolled in special education courses were black, the resolution was supported by linguists who believed that using a child's home dialect to help teach standard English would yield higher literacy rates and that it would also teach them how to code switch. The pilot program had been successful and the 1973 study showing how pronunciation correction affected learning added weight to this theory. The elementary years are a crucial time to foster a love of learning, not a repulsion or anxiety about it, so that the love of learning sticks for life. Nobody is saying we want to change English, we want to teach black English. We recognize the children who come to us, many of the children who come to us, have language systems that are not consistent with standard English. Teachers need to be aware of those systems and they must have tools to move the students from those systems to standard English. So the Oakland resolution intended for teachers and textbooks to incorporate AAVE in the same way that teachers were teaching English as a second language to meet children's needs that weren't being covered by standard education. Meaning there were students that did not know how to code switch and needed a bit of different instruction. Wrote a Washington Post columnist, studies show that once students understand the structural differences between Ebonics and standard English, they begin to demonstrate a greater proficiency in standard English and 
and to minimize their use of Ebonics. The resolution was misunderstood as a program intended to teach AAVE and slang and was criticized by Republicans, prominent Democrats, and the likes of Maya Angelou and Jesse Jackson. Said Angelou, the very idea that African American language is a language separate and apart can be very threatening because it can encourage young men and women to not learn standard English. This is quite different from her passage and I know why the caged bird sings saying, we were alert to the gap separating the written word from the colloquial. We learned to slide out of one language and into another without being conscious of the effort. At school, in a given situation, we might respond with, that's not unusual. But in the street, meaning the same situation, we easily said, it be like that sometimes. Said Jesse Jackson before changing his mind later, you don't have to go to school to learn to talk garbage. Must one senator have to smoke marijuana to be able to relate to teenage drug addiction? Should they smoke marijuana in order to teach them a better way? Definitely not. And the same is true with language. There was a flurry of anti-Ebonic sentiment, including a I Has a Dream poster printed by the National Head Start Association, warning against the Oakland Resolution. Warned Education Week in 1997, the resolution also suggests that some African American students are eligible for state and federal bilingual education and English as a second language money. Defenders of the resolution saw a mainly black school board being attacked by the white media, and critics saw it as something that would hold black children back, particularly potent arguments for the black middle class. And racists were like, why are they getting special treatment? Extra money? What? I think Ebonics is absurd. This is a political correctness that simply has gone out of control. Do you think that an African American person can hope to make a success in most fields in this country if this person says he be going to work and uses a question, I ask you, he be going to work? Most African Americans that are in fact uh, making it in our society uh, have one language style for the dominant society because we're not stupid. I mean, I think that's what we need to get away from. African Americans are not stupid. If a Spanish person comes to you speaking in uh, the remnants of their language, do you classify them as stupid? Or do you say they have a foreign language? The U.S. Senate held a hearing on the debate, leading Oakland to release an updated resolution without the word Ebonics. In the nearly 30 years since the controversy caused the resolution to be revised and stripped, not only has mass media and advertising shifted towards incorporating Ebonics and Black American slang into everything from ad campaigns to political slogans, bilingual education and the use of slang in school instruction is a common practice. And so is understanding that children learn differently and sometimes need alternative types of curriculum to succeed. Speech pathologist Julie Washington conducted a study that helped explain how code switching had been left out of the Oakland controversy. Most black Americans learn by a certain age that speaking in Ebonics in certain settings with white people can cause ridicule or disdain and it can lessen our opportunities and we effortlessly learn subconsciously to code switch. But about that effortlessly part. Julie Washington's study of nearly 1,000 low income income Southern elementary schoolers found that approximately one third of them, black English speakers, do not code switch. Students who do code switch, speaking both black English and standard English, usually scored higher than those who didn't. It's because of this, Washington and other experts argue, that those who do not code switch have a similar learning experience to say, native Spanish speakers. At a school Julie Washington studied in Michigan, teachers implemented a bilingual curriculum and saw a 75% increase in students who passed state reading tests. Additionally, because so many AAVE terms never go out of style within our community, chow, I'm looking at you, saying it's simply slang seems reductive. So taking this all into account, the argument for AAVE and Ebonics as a language is strong. But let's consider a few things. If Ebonics is a language, it can be shared, like Spanish or French or Japanese or Mandarin. If it's a language, to hear non-black people speaking it would take on a different meaning. By that same token, if it's a language, it can't be fundamentally changed from social pressure. Think about ain't, we be, she be, he be, or even more controversial terms like S-P-A-Z. About 
that word, which sparked backlash so huge it got Lizzo and Beyonce to remove lyrics using it from already released songs. And I'm not using it in this video because y'all not about to drag me and miss the entire point of the video. In the black community where I grew up, it always meant to turn up, whether good or bad, about or on somebody or something. And if you don't know what turn up means at this point in 2023, I don't know what to tell you. Usually when I used it, it meant to give somebody a good cussing to the point that we might come to the fisticuffs. I'm about to blank on your ass. I am about to blank on the post office because they lost my package, but it could also be good too. Oh, you were blanking at that party, girl. You was throwing that ass in a circle, a rhombus, a rectangle. It was not connected to the slang version mostly used in white culture to mean uncoordinated and or clumsy, a spinoff of the slur for people with cerebral palsy who suffer from body spasms and physical ailments. The root word is the Latin word spasticos or afflicted with spasms. Now, hold that thought if you see Ebonics as a language. In Mandarin, there is a filler slang word, niga, that sounds very much like nigga, and it means that, or it's used as a placeholder. And when you hear people who speak Mandarin speaking it very quickly, it sounds like they are saying nigga. Imagine my 18 year old Southerner shock hearing it regularly come out of Asian classmates' mouths up in Ohio while they held conversations that had nothing to do with me. Nigga. Well, those who claim Beyonce and Lizzo were being ableist and violent similarly seek to campaign for the removal of nigga from Mandarin vocabulary, or are we willing to admit misunderstanding black speech is par for the course and that context matters? In the rapper Flo Millie's 2020 song, 19, her lyric, got a yellow bitch with me, we bumblebee, she riding down LA while I roll the weed, refers to herself, a dark-skinned woman, and a light-skinned friend. In many since-deleted tweets linking the lyrics to anti-Asian hate, the historical use of of yellow as a slur against Asian people was conflated with a term for light skin in the black community. If AAVE is simply slang, it can be held to standards of social expectations. It would not be culturally untouchable like the Mandarin use of nigga. Similar words like bugging, tweaking, and crackhead have been called out to much lesser extent as pejorative terms that dehumanize or alienate or have roots in ableism and would be up for the same treatment as SPAZ. And by that same token, every person who dragged Beyonce, Lizzo, and black people who defended them is a hypocrite if they use terms considered ableist like stupid, dumb, crazy, lame, blind spot, tone deaf, crippling, etc. And if you mind the English language and all of its dialects, there are a bunch of terms with grisly or negative history still in play today. Drinking the Kool-Aid is pejorative because of the victims of 1970s cult leader Jim Jones, who forced his mostly black followers to drink poison Kool-Aid, resulting in the biggest mass suicide in American history. In the past Last decade or so, there's been debate over the use of the word master for bedrooms and architecture design due to the term master during slavery, though the term is much older than American chattel slavery. The term nitty gritty is believed to be the evolution of the French colonizer word for black and Creole people, nigritty. Wait, did I say that right? I don't speak French. Somebody tell me. It, it, What'd that word say? Pimping, which in the early 2000s came to mean cool, to make cool, or upgrade, is rooted in sex trafficking. And I don't even have to explain how we've transformed the word bitch, do I? Didn't I say earlier language is messy and chaotic? If AAV is just slang, like the vowel speak of the 80s or the Jersey Shore lingo craze of the late 2000s, people could argue it's eligible to be shared, tweaked, and discarded by those who don't embody the origins. And so either way, Ebonics, like any other language or dialect slang, is eligible to penetrate popular culture and be picked up by others. There is no scenario where it would not be used by others, and this is typical. Anybody can learn Spanish, French, or Italian without being Spanish, French, or Italian. In our English language, there are borrowed words like glitch, schmooze, bagel, and schmuck, all derived from Yiddish, the cultural language of Jewish people. These words are regularly used in standard American English devoid of their historical context. I'm not saying and this is okay, but I'm saying this is what happens. And this brings me to my next questions in a globalized world. Can a dialect or slang be stolen? Can words evolve past their original meaning? And if so, who has the power to make that call? Is language one size fits all in our hyper globalized culture? 
conversation I see on social media is regarding the alleged theft of words, but it's often missing historical context or the acknowledgement that language is fluid and transcends the cultures from which it came. I've seen tweets saying that words like tea and trade were originally used in 1980s ballroom culture or that they're from black queer people. While the ballroom divas, queens, and kings have more claim over the colloquial term cunt, interchangeably meaning cool, edgy, inspiring, fashionable, etc., and was originally a highly offensive term for white women that referred to the generals, it's not the case for tea and trade. The latter term, trade, has been in use for decades, and in my past studies I saw it mentioned in the late 19th century recollections of male sex work, thanks to a mix of Romani, sailor, and rhyming slang called Polari in the United Kingdom. I found an early example of tea being used in this February 1972 season one episode of Sanford and Son, and linguists in a Wired article linked tea to black women in the 1950s. It'll be necessary to get a detailed report of the circumstances surrounding A, the burglary itself, and B, the nature of the physical assault perpetrated on the victim. <laughs> he wants the tea on what got snatched and how you got wiped out. <laughs> Keep in mind, that clip was written by white men who sought to capture black dialect. But 1980s ballroom culture, made legendary by the 1990 film Paris is Burning and later RuPaul's Drag Race, was a continuation of drag balls that have existed since the 1890s and most documented in 1920s Harlem with the Hamilton Lodge Balls. These and other events were made up of black LGBT people in urban centers who, like other subcultures, carved their own communication that gave way to popular terms used now like working, being iconic, Yes! Shading and reading. Speaking of reading, which is a battle of wits and essentially a roast, you may have found yourself wondering, why do black people love to roast each other so much? Think clowning on people as a form of endearment, battle rap, or yo mama jokes, which have been around in some form since ancient Babylonia. Black people have long played the dozens, documented in the memoir of H. Rap Brown and various academic studies since 1939. In the dozens, which could be considered the predecessor to battle rap, people trade insults back and forth in the wittiest, most offensive, and most comical way possible, usually for the benefit of an audience, sometimes rhyming poetically with the intention of not being taken serious. Some argue that this served a greater purpose, an exercise in staying calm under pressure and not being sensitive. Handy lessons for growing up in a racist world, wrote Harry Lefevre. Taking umbrage is considered an infantile response to playing the dozens. Maturity and sophistication bring the capability to suffer the violence I'll talk with a plum, at least, and hopefully with grace and wit. It can be argued that the dozens was also a pioneering component of black Twitter's earliest years and beyond, where people regularly trade insults over minor slights for retweets in the wittiest, most offensive, and most comical way possible, usually for the benefit of an audience. While that's the norm for a lot of Twitter now, to the app's detriment, child. It brings me to the next topic, how AAVE has been made more accessible to the masses thanks to social media. From the earlier example of bay to chow to the bevy of words from a predominantly black ballroom culture, it is easier than ever for people to pick up terminology. Some white liberal in Idaho can choose an anime avatar, tweet the terminology, and ingratiate themselves into any cultural community they choose if they get the slang down, and that's a little scary to me. In the early social media days, slang and what was considered pejorative was more fluid and confusing than ever. When I first moved to Ohio for school, I picked up local black slang mainly from Cleveland slash the Midwest that sounded damn near foreign to my family and those back home. Like we would say like, that's Jake, meaning that sucks, that's not cool, that's that's ugly, whatever, Jake. Like sorry to all the Jakes. And the term I'm weak, which I picked up in Ohio, like I remember saying that while I was laughing at a party in Charlotte and someone asked me if I needed water or fresh air and was like concerned about me. Meanwhile, growing up, I never heard black people around me use the terms coon, or Uncle Tom as an insult because they were considered solidly slurs. But on black Twitter, in the wake of anti-Black Lives Matter sentiment and Donald Trump's rise, both became commonplace. When I was growing up, to call someone queer was an insult. On social media, it became an identity label. Cunt, once confined to ballroom culture and the LGBT community, lost its edge. Which, by the way, brings up an interesting point. Who was allowed to remix words if cunt was originally offensive to mostly white women? Like with black use of SPA which does not mean what it means for white people, the meaning of cunt has changed
changed, though it still gets used as a pejorative for women in white culture to massive outrage. Remember when commentator Samantha Bee was dragged for calling Ivanka Trump a cunt and people and advertisers got so mad Samantha was forced to give an apology? That's not cunt. Meanwhile, if you call me a cunt, the word would have no edge to it the way it does for white women because I didn't grow up hearing it. If you're not a woman and you use the word bitch, a word that came to be a prominent slur for women after the modern feminist movement, are you allowed to use the reclaimed endearment version or are you misogynistic? Or can we admit we know when a word is simply slang? Like when a straight man says that looking for a new barber is a bitch or a gay man calling his best friend's outfit cunty. We know they weren't being hateful, so can we act like it? In this new world of language, not only do slang words change, slang words are chewed up and miscredited repeatedly. We in this beach, finna get crunk. Abraz on fleek. The Summed up Teen Vogue on Kayla Newman, aka Peaches Monroe. Kayla's six second vine in 2014 left a lasting imprint on pop culture and fashion too. Rappers and singers like Nicki Minaj, Chris Brown, Christina Milian, and more did not hesitate to hop on the train and use her phrase. The same goes for big companies like Forever 21, IHOP, and Taco Bell, just to name a few. But like the other countless amazing creators of endless slang terms before her, Kayla didn't initially get credit as the term spread. But what makes her story stand out is that she eventually did get interviews, a GoFundMe payout, an indisputable historical credit. This is rare and fascinating for two reasons. On one hand, without the internet, the term never would have spread as a cultural phenomenon to be stolen, or at the very least, it would have taken years to circulate. But because of the internet, the word spread fast, and we were able to pinpoint when the term came into use and thus give credit. Kayla Peaches Monroe Newman will be in etymology history books, but not all creators of slang regardless of race, will get credit for the creations and never have. The internet has not only melted a globe of humans together, but across geographic lines, a more uniform English language is forming. Past accents and dialects are disappearing. Ebonics, whether you consider it a language or dialect as we have discussed, is used by a wider variety of people, even if they don't know where the words come from. This includes a southerner like me knowing Ohio slang or California slang or even knowing the right pronunciation of plantain because I got cussed out by some Jamaicans. Because of the global melting of words, I think internet users are increasingly centering and expecting a uniform language that disregards region, age, experience, and individual cultures, or even individual preferences. In my own videos, I've used the terms homosexual and queer in both historic context and for narrative style, and have received some complaints from older gay people who had a problem with one term but not the other, calling me phobic and not knowing that I myself am bisexual. I don't prefer the term queer for myself, but I have friends who do. When I asked my mother, a black woman with multiple sclerosis who experiences regular muscle spasms and bouts of immobility, what she thought about SPAZ, it was a culturally black word for her, not a slur. It's a word in her vocabulary meaning the aforementioned I'm about to turn up on somebody and cuss them out. The internet's advocacy for her and others purported to be impacted by the word's use didn't translate offline or resonate with everybody. Wrote black disability advocate Clementine Williams, who on one hand called for the word to be dropped from our vocabulary immediately, added, now I'm not using the history of SPAZ and AAVE to dismiss the harm that the slur has caused to the disabled community, but the majority of public callouts were tweeted by white disability advocates in the UK. Not everything is meant for everybody, nor is everything offensive to everybody. This muddles expectations of our increasingly standard language. Furthermore, when it comes to calling out ableist language, I've noticed something. Because many disabilities are not visible or disclosed publicly, how can you assume that someone is not disabled? Awareness about language is important, but when it comes to being an ally, at what point are you speaking over the people you claim to speak for? One in four Americans has a disability, and in addition to not always having adequate accessibility or accommodations, they are often discriminated in the workplace. But how do you drag someone for using an ableist term if you aren't sure that they're disabled? Should they publicize their medical records for the timeline to put you at ease? Also, another difference that I've noticed about being disabled and being black is that everybody black is born that way. Though many people are born with disabilities, plenty of other people become disabled later in life after a life of relative privilege. Nobody becomes black, though plenty of appropriators have tried. You either are or you aren't.
meaning anybody can come to inherit the issue of ableism, meaning most importantly, we need free healthcare for everybody, accessibility, and a destigmatization of disabled people. So please don't think I'm trying to diminish the realities of being disabled in an ableist society. But what I'm poking at here is that the ubiquity of disability means that there are a wide range of opinions on what words are offensive and which ones aren't. This is no different from there being a wide range of opinions on what the biggest political priorities are. Wrote disability advocate Ola Ojawumi in a thread on Twitter, the major disability stories this year that garnered global attention were two famous black women singers using the ableist slurs SPAZ. What the fuck? All while disabled black leaders are organizing to fight the disability, poverty, pandemic, housing insecurity, and police violence. This brings me to my next point, a lack of consensus among marginalized groups. And the opinions ebb and flow over time depending on historical context. There's of course the ongoing debate over nigga being used by black Americans. And lately I've been seeing more people say they will not use the colloquial term. And I predict this to become more mainstream in the next decade just like I predict predict a bigger and more organized black conservatism in the next decade, but that's another video for another day. A tweet from a mutual led me down a rabbit hole about blind spot being considered ableist, which I hadn't heard before. When I looked it up, a top search result said, this characterization isn't respectful of people who are blind or have a vision impairment. I have vision impairment and never thought about this word being disrespectful, but I'm not blind. So digging deeper, I found forums affirming that it's offensive and also rejected rejecting the idea that it's offensive, breaking down that blind spot is a medical term dealing specifically with the eye and that it isn't offensive. Rejection of the term blind spot seems to be very fringe, but will that always be the case? Language evolves every day. Through most tweets and sentiments I've seen from Inuit people, E-S-K-I-M-O is a slur, but I have seen tweets and blogs by Inuit people who insist that it isn't, some citing a new theory by the Alaska Native Language Center that linguists believe the word actually came from a French word meaning one who nets snowshoes. And as a black person who looks at black people sideways for giving non-blacks passes to say nigga, it's really not my black ass business to claim the word. I'll go with the majority sentiment I've seen and steer clear of the E word. By the same token, the push by leftists to use the inclusive term Latinx for all genders, which has been in use since the 90s and 2000s, has been met with scrutiny by Hispanic adults, with a poll saying only 3% use the terms themselves, though a whopping 57% said they didn't care how they were labeled. However, almost a third said they would be less likely to support candidates and organizations that use the term. And surprisingly to me, Hispanic seems to be the preferred term over Latino, which kind of put me in a sticky spot when writing this video because I usually use Latino. Numerous Hispanic organizations and leaders distance themselves from the word Latinx, with Arizona Democrat Ruben Gallego saying, when Latino politicians use the term, it is largely to appease white rich progressives who think that it's the term we use. Other critics say that the X included at the end of the word, which is not a plural ending original to the language, is proof of whitewashing. In response to a Connecticut bill proposed to ban the term Latinx, the director of Unidad Latina in Action said, Hispanic, Chicano, Latino, Latinx, Latine, Latino American, none of those terms encompass everyone in our community. We should not be policing the language that people are using to describe their identity. I bring this example up not to take a stance on the issue, especially because because I'm not Latino nor Hispanic and it's not my place, but to illustrate that language as we know it on the internet, historically thoughtful, contextualized by discourse and inclusivity, sometimes hyperbolic, etc., does not always translate in real life. It is not universal. The term black bodies, which is common in academia, has been called out for being dehumanizing and stripping black people of personhood. Relatedly, use the term uterus owners or birthing people around many older black women, especially those who have faced healthcare discrimination or have been told by activists in our community that we need to breed our way to success and ask them if they're offended. Many do not like those terms and view them as insensitive, dehumanizing, and misogynistic, stripping away the history of social expectations and treatment of specifically women for centuries. But then there are others who understand that the terms are meant to be inclusive of non-binary people and trans men who were assigned female at birth. Other examples that show generational divides, especially in the black community, are terms like fat 
and freak. When Lizzo removed the S word from her song after Backlash, she said, as a fat black woman in America, I've had many hateful words used against me, so I understand the power words can have. Maybe not realizing that fat is a much more widespread word, often at the center of dehumanizing and derogatory insults, and that it might be offensive to some people. Of course, Lizzo can refer to herself as fat all she wants, but if you call somebody in my family fat, or other people who grew up hearing the word in a bad way, they won't see it as being potty positive or empowering. Fat may be used by some people as a plain Jane adjective to destigmatize, especially among younger body positive people, but others take offense to the word, preferring to describe themselves in other terms. Then there's freak, which originally meant grotesque and came to be associated with the ableism of exploitative freak shows in the 19th and 20th century. Freak moves past that definition in the mid 20th century to explain drug trips as freaking out, and at some point along the way became a turn for sexual behavior, both good or bad. Among my Nana and mother's generations, it was not a good term for a woman to be called generally. Like, that woman is a cold freak. You're basically saying she a hoe. But nowadays, both freak and hoe are common self-descriptors. But does freak's past attachment to freak shows make it an ableist term? As I'm sure the soon-to-be messy comments on this video will reveal, few language choices are universal. I know the statement, go and touch grass, is overused, but increasingly it applies to waves of internet-only outrage. What's that there? Grass. That's right. Kneel down and rub it. Rub it. Let's take Rihanna, whose list of somehow untouchable offenses includes her billionaire status and louding of the scammer Sean King and putting abuser Johnny Depp in a Fenty fashion show. Let's glaze right over all of that. People, mainly black Americans, were pissed that she called her baby fine as fuck in a recent tweet. Not knowing that as numerous African and West Indian tweeters pointed out, fine means healthy and good, not attractive and sexually appealing. Very quickly, Rihanna's language choice drummed up allegations and discourse about grooming while stunned African and West Indian tweeters laughed. Again, as the girl who nearly got expelled from school for saying LMAO dead in a tweet, I couldn't help but note how this was just one of the many ways language is misunderstood and policed from a narrow and defensive perspective that ignores intent in individual cultures, whether intentionally or not. A bunch of ways to approach the topic of language, but I think you've got my main points. Language is a mess. It is subjective. Language can be an important tool of oppression and community building, but it is not viewed universally by the oppressed communities themselves. More troubling, it's an easy way to signal values, even if praxis doesn't follow. Additionally, through this quick rant style tour of etymology, we've learned about the importance of slang and its life cycle, how fluid language is, and how impossible it is to gatekeep it. It breaks my heart whenever I hear non-black people misuse AAVE or use it in general. And I'm sure it breaks other people's hearts when I say words differently from them, hypergamy, and mangle Latin and German in these videos. Language and dialects makes us feel like we're part of a community. Speaking the lingo of a given community grants a sense of belonging and security. And for black people, our language, or dialect, depending on how you view it, was born from our ancestors and family members who fought for every piece of our culture and paid for it with blood sweat and tears. So people taking our words and using them after misunderstanding them and mocking them for so long is a different kind of pain for some of us. So don't think I'm advocating for sitting white people down and enrolling them in Ebonics classes. But I say some of us because for other black Americans, it's not that deep. There have always been non-black people who adopt our way of speaking and in doing so, they're boosted up, applauded, or ignored by black people. So studying etymology and language history just makes it plain that it's impossible to control language or gatekeep it. I roll my eyes when I see people say we should stop speaking in AAVE around white people because they steal it. That we should just do it around us. Not only is gatekeeping impossible, but either language becomes central to main modes of speech or it dies. Speaking of, remember how I said the internet is creating a more uniform
uniform English language, there are over 573 dead languages in human history. And it's estimated that up to 1,500 currently known languages may no longer be spoken by the end of the century because of greater access to centralized education, the internet, and mobility. Do you think that's good? Do you think it's bad? Going forward, I think we need to consider a few things before zeroing in on people's language choices. First of all, the internet seems to amplify the hyperbolic abilities of language. We've gotten so fucking dramatic. Everything is iconic, slang, the greatest thing ever, or everything is the worst thing ever, literal violence, or makes the speaker wanna unalive themselves. On one hand, that means boosting the most marginalized and helping cool creators and business owners go viral with funny jokes and dramatics and words that stand out. But it's also a lot of virtue signaling and a lot of projecting. Harking back to the Flo Millie, Beyonce, Rihanna, and Lizzo examples, maybe we could ask questions before immediately deciding to drag. What is the meaning of the word for the person speaking it? Does the word hold current power to destroy or has it evolved past its original meaning? Where is the speaker from and what is their dialect? Which came first for the speaker, the positive meaning or the negative one? Is the negative history of the word well known in the speaker's country or region? Do you know the person's medical history? Lastly, before slapping them with a label of being violent, which has a very specific meaning by the way, using or involving physical force intended to hurt, damage, or kill someone or something, ask if the word in question is being directed at someone. I feel like asking these questions would solve a bunch of problems. Of course, don't be obtuse with this. This does not excuse words that have been nearly universally called out, like the F word, the hard ER word, the T word, or various racial epithets that are clearly documented and hated. Can we do that thing that we rarely do on the internet and find some balance? Balance? Like when we know when something is malicious and when we know when something isn't? Like can we use some fucking discernment? Run back the bitch and cunt examples if you're still confused about this. If I sound heated, it's cause I am just a little bit. But writing this video made me wonder about how language will be spoken, studied, and discussed in the future. Will current words not deemed problematic change status or meaning in the years to come? Will Ebonics be sanitized? Will it be less marketable by brands? Should it be? And what will future historians have to grapple with when analyzing contemporary sources? Will they understand Twitter roasts as bouts of the dozens and throwing shade slash reading people down? Will they know when statements are hyperbolic or sarcastic? And will they take harmless slang as violent threats? Like in the case of my ill-fated freshman year use of the word dead? Stripping such statements of context to fit a narrative or expectation? Only time will tell. I hope this all came across respectfully. Like this video has given me a lot of anxiety writing it over the past few months because I really hope nobody attempts to misconstrue my words. But this is a tricky topic to navigate. And as I've stressed in this video, language isn't universal. And ultimately I said what I said, but that doesn't mean people will hear what I said. What do you think? This was mainly a video about American English slang variations because I speak English. For those of you who speak other languages or live outside of America, let me know some examples of your own. Are you worried about the standardization of American English impacting you in your home country? And remember, if you're a black American, be sure to tell me if you consider Ebonics a language, dialect, or slang. If you use the N word, if you care about other people using the N word, be sure to let me know in the comments so we can start talking about it. Thank you so much for watching another one of my videos and I hope you enjoyed. If you really like this video, you can go subscribe to me over on Patreon for just $1 a month because all of your contributions help me create amazing content like this. Be sure to like this video and subscribe.